Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Araminta Show. Welcome to a brand new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia, and I am here with two very special guests. Um, one that we haven't had in a while. Uh, we have back um, the author of Slimed and Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, and uh, part of the um, On Your Mark documentary, we have Matthew Clickstein. Welcome back, Matthew. Thank you, Patricia. Happy to be here. And uh, one that we uh, interviewed over five years ago, but this is the first time he's been on a podcast. Uh, he's... Uh, the host of Double Dare, What Would You Do, the executive producer of mo- a lot of shows on the Food Network, and the main focus on the documentary, we have Mark Summer. So welcome, Mark. Thank you so much. I feel, uh, I don't know, uh, inappropriate here in that there's a Matthew, a Patricia, and then Mark, you know? It just, it just doesn't go well. I need to add another syllable or something in my name, I think. We'll call you, we'll call you Mark. We'll call Mark. Yeah. We'll call you Mark. All of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah i i would so yeah basically um by the time that i'm going to be posting this the tour of the um on your mark documentary will be starting uh, around los angeles and then we'll be traveling across the country in a few places such as philadelphia and baltimore and new york and chicago so yeah um i'd love to know um mark uh lo- love to know from uh, you know your perspective about like what made you decide to do a show? That's basically what the, partly of the documentary is about. The show that you performed in Indiana discussing about your life, uh, you know, your, your time in show business as well as your OCD. So, yeah, I'd love to know what made you decide to perform on stage in front of people discussing about your story. Well, I've been doing it my whole life. Um, I'm a live performer, you know. You kind of get pigeonholed in the minds of the American public, and they think I'm a game show host or a guy who talks about Twinkies. But the reality of it is I started off as a professional magician uh, back in Indiana in uh, the 60s and then went to college and started doing stand-up. Well, first I worked at the Magic Castle in L.A. for many years, and then I became a regular at the comedy store, uh, you know, a part of my life that many people aren't even aware of. In 1976, I was a regular with Dave Letterman, uh, Jay Leno, Robin Williams, uh, Gary Shandling. We all started at the same time. Uh, the difference between those guys and me was they were funny. And uh, I, <laughs> I realized quickly that I was never going to be in that league. Uh, I would sit in the back of the room and I had, you know, I had a solid 18 minutes, but I was never as good as Dave or Robin or Jay or Gary or, you know, more than 20 people I could mention that you've never even heard of. And so it was a reason to get up on stage and perform, but I realized I was better being Mark Summers than I was going on stage and trying to be funny as a, as a stand-up comic. And so I decided to go into the hosting side, and hosting a game show was something I always wanted to do. But the reality of it was theater was my first love. I started doing theater when I was 13 years old. Uh, first show I ever did was Bye Bye Birdie, um, and, and kept doing local theater. And that was my dream. I would walk down to a, the one newsstand in Indianapolis that sold 
weekly variety and and you know figure out how can i get to audition for a touring show or someday do broadway and in the meantime you know you go to college and you get married and you have kids and you host shows at nickelodeon and then you host shows at food network and you do shows at lifetime and 17 other networks and then you realize that you know all of a sudden you're in your late 50s and you never really kind of did what you really wanted to do i mean i had some nice success but the passion was still doing theater and so i had these two little incidences happen in my life one i got cancer and the other one was um i was in a car accident and broke every bone in my face and so i cheated death twice and uh it was at that point after sitting and talking to a lot of my friends in the theater world uh they told me to stop talking about it already and go do it so um i had met a guy at a bar in new york city one night called angus mckindos and he came up to me and he said someday i could have been you and i said well what what does that mean he said well i auditioned for double dare but i didn't get the part and i said yeah well you and about a hundred other people i said there's two thousand people auditioned for that show and so i said well what do you do for a living now and he said i'm a broadway producer well that was it that's all i had to hear so we became fast friends and after uh you know getting over cancer and after uh getting my face fixed uh, after the car accident i called him up and said you know i'm old but how do i get on uh, stage and he said i just took over a theater in long beach island new jersey and uh we're doing grease this summer and if you want to play vince fontaine it's yours and i said do i have to audition he said no so i rehearsed for a month and we did it for about three weeks and in the process i met a very talented 24 year old gentleman by the name of drew gasparini and all of a sudden this 60 year old guy was hanging out with a 24 year old not only backstage but after we completed the performances i was in new york city hanging out with him and his other 24 and 25 year old friends and i was having a ball i was singing at studio 54 below i was working at joe's pub and sketches and um, shows with these guys and then he introduced me to a very talented young man by the name of alex brightman who last year was the star of school of rock on broadway and he's been in about six or seven other broadway shows and we were hanging out one night and i said you know i want to do a one-man show and so they would take me or i would actually take them at the time they were starving artists no longer um to dinner about every six or eight weeks and they would just ask me questions for two or three hours and in about a year year and a half they handed a script to me and uh through their connections i started it at the uh bloomington playwrights project in bloomington indiana where we actually shot uh, this movie and uh then we closed the adirondack theater festival that august about a year ago and uh, in the process, uh, this lovely human being, uh, Matthew Christine, said, hey, Summers, why don't we do a movie? And I knew Matthew because not only did he write the book Slimed, and I wrote the uh, little introduction for that book, and we became friends because he ended up working for me for several years, uh, booking all the restaurants on Restaurant Impossible. I, I didn't want to do this. I, I couldn't think of a reason to do a documentary on me. Uh, my feeling was like, who cares? But being the persistent person that he is, and that's why I love the man. Uh, can I put it down twice? <laughs> uh, he uh, he uh, convinced me after the third time to do it, and I said, uh, "I know nothing about film. Uh, this play is something I haven't ever done before. I'm scared out of my mind. Uh, just stay out of my way and uh, make sure that you don't uh, you know screw up the process because I'm very nervous about this." And he managed to put. Um, a beautiful piece of work on uh, I, had, I had nothing to do with it I'm just going to tell you that other than saying yes um, Matt Klickstein and his team of people that he put together from around the country had a vision and they put this thing together and I didn't know what to expect and when I saw the first rough cut which was about an hour and 40 minutes I went holy cow how do people do this I do live performing uh, I do you know magic I do comedy I do game shows I do food shows I wouldn't know the first thing about film I still don't know the first thing about film and I was blown away by the whole situation and we've gone through many transformations we've got it uh, to about an hour and 20 minutes and we premiere this thing uh, in Los Angeles on the 8th of October then to New York City on the 12th uh, on the 13th we're in Philadelphia then we go to Austin, Texas, Baltimore, Maryland, where Pat Sajak will be uh, hosting the talk back that night. And finally, we close in Chicago. And then, uh, you know, what's happening next, uh, I can't tell you just yet. Uh, the game plan is to get it on 
somewhere. Uh, Netflix, HBO, Amazon, something like that, and that will happen, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so there's the uh, seven minute, 24 second version of why I decided to do this. Wow. <laughs> Time to exactly to the T. <laughs> See, I, I'm really it's curious. Like the opening of Touch of Evil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm kind yeah, of. People catch that reference. Exactly. Yeah. If you know the reference, leave it in the comments below and we'll give you an internet cookie. <laughs> anyway, so, anyways, I, I'm really, I'm really glad that you persisted, Mark, because it was kind of like a similar story. I remember a few years ago when I saw um, a YouTube clip of your interview with Oprah discussing about your OCD and then eventually you wrote the book. It, it kind of, I felt like this was kind of like another way of opening yourself to the world. Like, the, you know, just the way you, you wrote about your experiences with OCD in that book, in a similar way you open about your years doing TV and theater and magic and eventually of everything that happened to you in, uh, later on in your life that ended up tragic, but eventually you found a... Uh, you found the light at the end of the tunnel, so we get to see an, uh, another layer of you that most people who grew up with watching Double Dare or What Would You Do or even your programs on um, the Food Network would, you know, learn to know more about. But, you know, it's fascinating. Um, I, I'm somewhat of an open book. Why, I don't know. I kind of don't have a filter. I kind of say whatever I want to say. Sometimes I offend people. Sometimes I don't. If you watch me on Twitter, you know, I'm very ready to come back at people. I'm not going to suffer fools or you know, take uh, any BS from anybody. I'm pretty strong about standing up about what I believe in or for. And, um, I, you know, I kind of, uh, my, my modus operandi is I've been wanting to help people kind of since I got to the planet. And I think on the OCD book, um, I took some hits in my career for a while, but to this day, that book was written around 1999 when somebody comes up to me and says, I saw you on Oprah or I saw you on the Today Show. Uh, I read your book. I didn't know what I had. Now I do. You changed my life. You saved my life. That's been important. You know, sitting next to Oprah and exposing yourself to the world was a pretty crazy thing. After I did it, my parents didn't talk to me for a year because uh, they were embarrassed. Um, you know, and so... Uh, this uh, movie kind of shows another side. You know, everybody uh, everybody assumes that the guy who goes on stage is so confident and, uh, you know, self-assured. And, you know, uh, Mr. Clickstein will tell you that I had zero confidence when I walked on that stage. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. In fact, the night before we opened, uh, we did a preview, and I had to restart the show six times because I couldn't remember a line. And, and so... There's that aspect, um, you know, and I was going into chemotherapy once four or five years ago, and I, I was sitting next to somebody in the waiting room, and the guy said, are you who I think you are? And I said, well, who do you think I am? And he said, are you that guy on Food Network? And I said, yes. And he said, why are you here? And I said, same reason as you, to get chemotherapy. And his response was, I didn't think guys like you got cancer. Now, I didn't even know what the hell that means, but for some reason... The world puts entertainers or semi-famous people and even famous people on platforms that shouldn't exist, and I don't understand what that's all about. And everybody's got a story. You have a story, Patricia, which I'm sure would be a really good movie. I know Matt does. Um, I was just lucky enough to find the right people who were able to pull it off and get it done because I've been in business for 40 years. But everybody's got a story that's, that's pretty interesting, I have a feeling. If you're around long enough, you do. Sure. I mean, you know, I started off as, um, you know, I was, a, you know, I, I've probably maybe t once or twice I've told about the story in blogs, but, you know, when I was born, I was born with severe autism and my mom uh, took me to the doctor to find out what was going to happen to me. And the doctor told my mother straight on saying, I regret to inform you, but your daughter's never going to speak. Your daughter's never going to function in normal society. She's never going to graduate from high school. She's never going to interact with people in a normal way. And look where I am now. Yeah, that guy's a moron. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, you just can't buy into what anybody tells you. And, and part of the theme of this movie and of the one-man show is uh, overcoming the word no. Um, my whole life I was told no. Now, I knew growing up in Indiana that I had zero talent. I'm not just saying that to be self-deprecating. I had zero talent. I loved to watch the Ed Sullivan show and J. 
Jack Carr and Johnny Carson, and I'd watch you know comedians and performers and talk show hosts wanting to do that, but. A turning point in my life, I was doing magic shows in Indianapolis, and I was on a kid's TV show, Popeye and Janie, and I kind of owned the town uh, as far as being, you know, Mr. MC, even at age 18, and I left it and went to college in Boston, <clears throat> and I remember going to my first audition, and I just sucked. I mean, I, I was I was on up for this uh, show, and, and I died, and this kid from New York came up to me and said nice Bob Orban material. Now, Bob Orban was sort of this hack comedian who wrote joke books for guys like me who weren't funny. And I had basically written my act on Bob Orban's jokes. And the fact that this guy knew about Bob Orban, because I thought it was a big secret, and he showed me how bad I was. And so you could be a big fish in a small pond, Indianapolis, Indiana, and then you move to Boston, New York, Los Angeles, and you realize that's where there are some really talented people and you make you make a decision you either pretend that you're good and keep going and chances are you'll go nowhere or you say okay i suck how do i get better and the way you get better is you just do it over and over and over and over and over and over again and i remember auditioning at the magic castle and auditioning at the comedy store for over a year I used to host a wet t-shirt contest at a place called Big Jaws in Long Beach, California for $50 on a weekend. Uh, anytime I could get on a stage and perform, that's what I did. And uh, Gary Collins, guy used to host uh, our magazine, became a dear friend of mine, said to me, unless you're the most unlucky human being in the world, if you pursue it and do it long enough, odds are you're going to be successful. So I moved to L.A. in 73. I didn't get double there until 86. So it was 13 years of doing time, but when I got the opportunity to audition for Double Dare, I was ready. If I would have gotten that same audition when I first moved to L.A., wasn't a chance in hell I was ever going to get that show. Yeah, and I think that's a very important lesson for anybody, whether you're acting or whether you're doing art or animation or voice acting or acting on stage or whatever. That's a very important lesson that if you do bad the first time that you ever do something that you want to be passionate about, then you just have to keep on going. And, you know, of course it's going to take a long time, maybe for some longer than others, but if you keep being persistent at it, you will eventually find your path and it'll eventually take, uh, it'll eventually take you somewhere that you would have never expected to. And, uh, with well, most people don't, they don't have the, the guts to stick it out. They don't have the balls to stick it out. They get turned down three or four times and, and they're done, you know, and they think it's easy. And the question is, in the meantime, how do you support yourself? Well, I started off as a page at CBS, and then I was a production assistant on a bazillion shows. I eventually became a game show writer on a show called Fun Factory, another show called Celebrity Sweepstakes. I did a bunch of that stuff. I became an audience warm-up guy. Um, you know, the Magic Castle paid me a whopping $145 a week for 28 shows. Um, whatever it took, I wasn't afraid to do it. Um, I just wanted to keep working. If that meant seven days a week and if it meant, you know, uh, juggling three balls. I, I may be the only person I've ever met in the entertainment industry who never did a job outside of entertainment. I never was a waiter. I never worked at a department store. Uh, not, a, not that that's demeaning or that I look down on anybody who's done that. I just never wanted to take a job outside of show business. And everything I have done in my entire career has somehow related to the arts. And I feel very fortunate that I've been able to do that. Yeah, that's incredible. Absolutely. It lets you get a more bigger appreciation on the arts and all the peaks and the layers and the different paths of where it would have ended up, whether you would have taken one route or another. Well, you know, I think it's all about passion. And, and that's what, uh, and I'll shut up because Clickstein's got a lot more important things to say than I do. <laughs> but uh, I, I just think passion is what gets you through not taking no for an answer, uh, figuring out a way to get from point A to point B, which is sometimes a circuitous route, but, you know, you figure it out. You know, and I always say this about Matt that, you know, he's sort of a young version of me. Um, he's doing the kinds of things that I did when I was his age uh, because you just, you just have to. Because, you know, uh, I lecture to colleges all the time, and my opening line is nobody got up this morning and said, I got to go get Mark Summers a job today. And, and that's what it's all about. And we had a, a little blip in the road recently on, on our project uh, where a major theater group was going to present our movie and something happened and they had to go away. And there we were, you know, this is all of two weeks ago. What the hell are we going to do now? 
and Clifton figured it out and got us to a bigger, better place. Uh, and it's going to be even you know cooler than, than initially. So how do you do that in that time frame in Los Angeles, California, when there's a million other things going on? I don't know, but he did it. And so uh, I go online and I see things. There was a, a, a thing online the other day with this Troma Studios and talking about slime, and then they roll into a thing about how I supposedly created it, which I didn't, but it was a, a cool video. And, you know, I, uh, websites. I don't know anything about websites. I'm a 66-year-old man. You know, every time I go, the, uh, Clifstein's got something else on there. He's got pictures. He's got, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, how he does it, okay? I, I just admire the hell out of him uh, be, because he, he knows what he's doing. And this, this, this whole project would never have happened if it wasn't for him. It just, it, I wouldn't know the first thing about it. So I applaud him. I admire him. I will now shut up because he could tell you how he did the whole darn thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, please, <laughs> Matthew. The go, go ahead. We, we love to know, Matthew. So um, how did this come to be? Well, as, uh, first of all, of course, I would have to say that it's extremely humbling. And, you know, these are the kinds of moments that make it all worthwhile over the years. Uh, not only working on the project, but getting to know Mark. Um, he is somebody that um, I think of as a friend, one of my best friends. Uh, I think of him, obviously, as a mentor, uh, both as a professional in the entertainment industry and media industry and just as a man himself. Um, you know, just the way he leads his life, uh, the way he is with his family and the other people around him. Um, you know, I've gotten to know him well enough, both, again, as a friend and as someone who's worked for him for Restaurant Impossible over the years, where I know how he interacts with other people. Um, and I and I observe it and I watch it. And, you know, I, I sometimes say, you know, it would have been great to do a documentary or, or a book or something on, you know, any number of people, you know, rock stars and other filmmakers and like, and, you know, a lot of these people are not the best people in the world. They're drug addicts or they're bad to their wives or their families or they have a checkered past. I'm really proud that not only is this movie something that I think is a very good film and it's about a very interesting person, Mark, but that he's a good guy and that I'm really proud that I'm promoting, you know, the life perspective of somebody that I think is, you know, leads an admirable life. Um, so, uh, you know, just to start from the beginning there with how I got to this point, um, and Patricia, as you know, probably some of your listeners and whatnot, uh, fans of the book Slime, um, you know, I just reached out to Mark when I was putting together that book, which tells the story of Nickelodeon, uh, got together about 250 different people um, from the, what we call golden age of Nickelodeon, the 80s and early 90s. Um, Mark was one of the first people, of course, I reached out to. He was the face of the network. Double Dare is one of the shows that really launched uh, the network into the stratosphere, as we all know. And I knew I had to get Mark. And Mark, being the guy that he was, not only did he uh, agree to an interview with me, in fact, I think we did a couple interviews, but before I knew it, he was agreeing to doing the forward. He did excellent forward. Um, and the funny thing about the forward, I got to tell you one story, though. So I get yeah, this car I love the back from a Restaurant Impossible episode, and it was raining in Philadelphia, and we get this horrific, horrific crash in a, in a cab, and I literally break every bone in my face, and uh, they're, they're putting all sorts of you know sheet metal in my body to keep it together, and and um, I was drugged up beyond belief. I I, I just I was on a, the planet Xenon. <laughs> and, and Matt calls me and says, uh, I need to uh, forward tomorrow. And I'm going, oh, man, I, I'm swollen. I can hardly talk. I, I'll do the best I can. So I did one draft, okay, on this thing, which I thought sucked, okay? And, and Clifton calls me and goes, this, this is amazing. I'm not going to change a word, which maybe I should have done drugs back in the 60s because it, <laughs> it, it was that good. It really uh, was so It was so good. And Chris, I know you know it, <laughs> and probably a lot of your readers know it. Um, Mark read, I think the whole thing is not an excerpt at our launch event in the 90 Second Y uh, that we did uh, when the book came out in 2013. And I, I remember the feeling of just how well written it was, how, how funny it was, how true it was. It was concise. And just being excited that my book gets to start with with this story from Mark Summers. And all the editors and everyone obviously was so excited that Mark would do that. And again, you know, they weren't ex- we weren't even sure he was going to agree to the interview at first, but he did. And then the forward, and, you know, slowly but surely, Mark and I uh, became friends. And he believed in me enough and appreciated the work that I did putting together the 92nd uh, Y event, which, you know, I had 40 people there. and went on for three hours and was like hold on you had 40, 40 former Nickelodeon people you had a thousand <laughs> yeah. people in the audience okay. yeah which is and, not and that was a whole other thing 
when he, when he first called the folks at Nickelodeon and said, you know, I'm going to do this book and I need phone numbers and emails and all that stuff, they went, yeah, good luck. You'll never get any of these people. So one by one, how many people did you contact uh, eventually? 250 in the end, you know. Yeah, so they put 250. And that was back before everyone was just, you know, on Facebook or on Twitter. I mean, I was tracking every single person down individually. And, you know, a lot of these people uh, told me later that, you know, a lot of them had wanted to talk to people a few times when they had been reached in the past because they were a little maybe embarrassed by what they had done, you know, because, you know, it's just these little kid shows or whatever it was, or they, they, they weren't really sure if they wanted to talk to people. But after what I did with, with the book, they were so happy to talk with other people and everything. And that really opened the doors to, you know, some of these other documentaries that are coming out now and some of these other articles and the like. And, you know, they've told me that. And I, you know, and I'm not just saying that about myself on the head. You no, know, no, you, you started that whole thing. All, all those reunions that have happened started at that event. I mean, he had everybody from the cartoon side to the live action side, you know, game shows, talk shows, whatever we did back in the day at Nick. And, you know, uh, we each had 20, 30 minutes. I hawked and took a little bit more, of course. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, it was it was an amazing freaking meeting, you know, and he put that together at the 92nd Street Y with, you know, paper uh, clips and chewing gum and, uh, you know, I don't know how he did that as well. How do you get a thousand people to show up to something? When... It, was not, it was not easy. Yeah, just, no. just to wrap it up for you, uh, uh, Patty, um, you know, so because of that, and we're not just boasting to boast, but that's why Mark believed in you so much. And he saw what I did with the book, he saw what I did with the 92nd Y. He helped me get the job working for him at the Restaurant Impossible uh, show doing the casting producing work. And, you know, we just, we became fast friends. And he knew I could do my work. Uh, he saw some of the other things I was doing as well around this time. And eventually, as he said, you know, I started pitching him the idea of doing a documentary. He was not interested. He didn't think that he was, you know, viable enough of an entity to do a documentary on. But then once, you know, the theater show came together, we said, okay, now we have something. Because, you know, again, just, just to wrap it up real quick here, you know, one thing that we're both a little frustrated and disappointed in with some of these pop culture documentaries that are coming out now is they're all very much the same. They're all very much, you know, let's gather as many people as possible, talking heads, you got the Ken Burns, you know, moving foot photographs, the kind of lo-fi 80s video game music. There's really no story. It's just kind of a meandering hour and a half or two hours of just talking about a person or a video game or a movie or whatever it is. And then it's done. And that's not a story. That's not a film. That's a collection of people talking. And frankly, and when I said to Matt, let me interrupt you here for two seconds, Matt. Yeah. One of the things I said is, and I said this to the guys who wrote the One Man Show, if somebody walks in and is dragged to this thing and doesn't know who Mark Summers is, there better be a damn good show there. better be a damn good story. Yeah, I, I gave story. the same instructions to Matt is, you know, somebody gets dragged to a movie theater or is flipping through uh, on cable and, and this thing pops up, why would they stay? And and what he was able to do, and this is what he does so well, is he told a great story. He told, a, you know, a background of a kid from Indiana who wanted to be in show business and, you know, went back to my high school and we interviewed that, went back, he found my first grade teacher, he found the guy who started me in magic, um, you know, we just did, he did all the stuff and in the meantime, the background was, here's this 60 year old man who's always wanted to do this but hasn't been able to follow through and he's had this other success and I was kind of put my ass on the line because this could have been a major failure and and by the way indiana was sort of survival of the fittest uh it was an 80 seat black box theater and my goal was to make one person cry in the three weeks of performing and i think uh you know we got sort of 80 percent standing ovations which never happens at this theater they tell me and people you know crying their eyes out people flying in from canada from houston texas driving down from chicago uh it, it was fascinating and and the thing that I'm so proud about is uh, the way Matt put this thing together is it, it, it's a fascinating movie uh, just about a person who struggled and everybody thinks maybe, well, it's been an easy, you know, journey from point A to point B. And he pointed out that, you know, life ain't so grand all the time. And uh, and he did it in an hour and 20 minutes. So good for him, you know. Absolutely. Good for him. I, I just, you know, just to say, no, I appreciate all that. And I, I feel really grateful that Mark... Uh, allowed me to do this, um, and as you said, I do want to make sure that, that this is put in there as well, of course, that, you know, I was able to put together a really great team of people, um, and, you know, I, I could not have done it without, you know, people like Josh Sean and Eric Cubs, John Beckham, uh, Chloe Sullivan, who helped us edit it, 
Um, and just so many of the people around the country, you know, my, an old friend of mine in Portland, uh, Mark Johnson, who did the music, and, you know, we had some fun animation stuff that we were originally going to do with the film, but we ended up just keeping it online because it, it didn't really fit in the film, but we, we had some fun animation stuff from our uh, team in Boulder, Patrick Malik, and, uh, you know, Mighty Fudge Studios, we had a bunch of people in Lawrence, Kansas, um, you know, just all over the country, all these different people helped out. You know, no one was getting really paid. You know, it was a little bit of money at first, and then, you know, we burned through that, and we had to just kind of keep going. And, you know, we, we really became a labor of love for us. And, you know, we all have day jobs or, you know, freelance gigs or other things. Everyone's got families and wives, and some people even have kids. And, you know, this just became this thing that we all really started working on so hard together to do it. And we would not have been able to do it without, you know, the support of one another. And definitely just Mark, you know, shaking, you know, nodding his head and saying, yes, this is really coming together. This is working. Um, so I'm, I'm just very proud of how we we're all able to collaborate throughout the country. And, you know, it is, again, a testament to the love and the admiration we all have for Mark, both, again, as a professional, um, as, you know, somebody we grew up on, you know, watching, but also as just, you know, the man that we know him to be. And, you know, we said we have to do this for Mark. We have to do this for the fans. And, you know, we want to make something that is really going to be, you know, a real story, a real film. And, you know, we have the talking head elements with, you know, Mark and Robin Harvey, obviously, from Double Dare. And, you know, some of Mark's, you know, more famous friends like Neil Patrick Harris and Guy Fieri uh, and a few others. So, you know, that element is in there as well. You know, Phil Moore from Nick Arcade. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is it is anchored in a real story of Mark putting together this show and the uh, trepidation that he has, whether or not he'd be able to do it. Um, and, you know, I was just bolstered by everyone working their butts off and saying, we need to make this right. We need to make this work. And I think that we did. We uh, did. And he, he mentioned a kid by the name of Josh Sean. And Josh, I might have met Josh when he was 15, 16 years old initially. And, you know, Josh is in his 30s. I mean, all these kids grew up watching me on Nickelodeon. And to be working with them and having them even want to do this and hang out and, and make this thing happen... Uh, I'm just so honored, you know, Dick Clark was always the guy who, you know, went from generation to generation, these people follow him, and I've been very fortunate that a generation of kids who grew up watching me on Nick follow me over to Food Network and various other things I've done, and to get to work with these guys, and a lot of them, you know, I walk into radio and TV stations around the country when I do appearances, and people come up to me all the time and say, the reason I'm in this industry is because you guys look like you were having so much fun on Nickelodeon, but that makes me feel like a million bucks, so here's Clickstein, and here's Josh Yawn, and the other people he mentioned, who, you know, my, my idol was Soupy Sales, and and he was a kid show host when I was growing up, and I became a dear friend of his and hung out with him, and we used to have, have lunch at the Friars Club in New York City, and I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Every time I was with Soupy, I was a nervous wreck. I just didn't know what to say. I was, like, tripping all over myself because when I was a kid, my mom... Uh, family grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and he was from Detroit, and I'd watch Detroit TV, and there was Soupy, and the next thing I know, I'm working at a comedy store, and I'm on the same stage with him, and, you know, then I'm hanging out at his house, and he's calling me in the middle of the day, just saying funny stuff, and that's just a weird feeling to, to grow up watching somebody and then become their friend, and so the other thing I realized was there were many people that were not terribly nice to me on the way to my career, and I always felt if I was lucky enough to make it, I was uh, not going to be the same kind of uh, shithead. And uh, it's it's nice to pay back to all these people who've been so kind to you throughout the years and been so loyal. So that's been a fun part for me as well. That's fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that. So, yeah, I really don't want to give too much about the documentary because I want everybody to see it. So um, yeah, we're just going to end it right here. So uh, once again. Uh, I'll leave more information about the documentary on the description box below for everybody to check out. And if you are in the areas where they will be traveling and where they'll be showcasing the documentary as well as a, cool, a whole bunch of cool stuff, then please go over there and check it out while you have the chance. Um, yeah, so any final words right before we go? Go to MarkSummersMovie.com. Patricia, you were fantastic, and I appreciate your time. Absolutely, and thank you I'm so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> okay, take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, let us know in the comments below about if uh, you are interested in checking out On Your Mark. Uh, let us know if when you do have the chance to see it by the time that I'm going to be posting this. Uh, they'll be at Los Angeles performing their first night, and then they'll be traveling across the country. And actually, by the time that I'll be posting this, I'll be making my trip over to New York, and I'll be seeing them at their New York performance. So if any of you guys are going to be at the New York area around October 12th, 
um, yeah, definitely come on by and maybe we'll meet up with these guys. Maybe you'll even meet up with me and say hi, whatever. But yeah, that's it, everybody. Thank you so much. Hope to see you around soon. Thank you for listening. On your mark, get set. I think it's an authenticity that the kids, they'll sense the lack of that in a heartbeat. And I think they thought he was just like quirky and weird and funny. I'm doing a one-man show called uh, The Life and Slimes of Mark Summers, Everything in His Place. This company has sold out every single production since May of 2014. Well, I'll put an end to that, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm very scared about, is this going to happen? I have no doubt. No doubt with my husband, with Mark, he can do it. I instantly knew what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I was in the zone, and I wasn't even trying. 90% of what's in the show right now actually happened and is as exciting as it really happened. A guy with crippling OCD becomes world famous for being the messiest game show host in history? That's crazy. He wants to brush it off and say, oh, it's no big deal, it wasn't that bad. But then a different moment he'll tell me how he would fold a shirt over and over and over again. I cried. My tears came to my eyes when I saw that. To put it on paper and to act it out and go back and do it is why I guess I'm an emotional wreck. What he said to me years later was it was such good TV I didn't care. I defy anybody to ever look at an episode and say I was not having a good time. Yeah! I didn't talk about having cancer nationally because in show business it can ruin your career. He's had these weird and wild chapters. He seems like a kind of unstoppable dude. Highlighting his life in this theater performance is probably one of the bravest, most giving things somebody could do. I think there's a lot to learn, a lot to love, a lot to share, a lot to experience. But the life of Mark Summers, well, it should be a ride in an amusement park because it's got every twist and turn you can imagine.